Well, hello, everyone. For those who do not know, my name is Jerry Hicks. I am Dark Wolf's alter ego. I don't have any fancy PhDs to flaunt in front of you that I do apologize for. However, I have been a paranormal researcher for over 25 years. Now, before we do bring out our keynote speaker, I would like to say a few words. Do you know why it is so very important that you're here right now? I bet no one in this room really knows the answer to that. It's because of the solidarity that we all feel as affected people. Every one of us has dealt with this. We've lost family, friends, coworkers, businesses, wives, husbands. All of us has dealt with this somehow in the Mandela effect. So we all know exactly what it feels like by, for just believing our memories and not giving in to the reality that we're presented with. I've heard a lot of talk here as I've been the last couple of days enjoying meeting the speakers and all you attendees and the ones that I have had a chance to sit down with. And I've heard a lot about mystery schools. And you know, we are like a modern version of the old mystery schools. It's not like we're hiding our information. Lord knows we try to tell people, but we get the craziest answers. We get those weird stares. They'll just stare off into space. And then they'll come back and read you the entire wiki page, word for word. <laughs> <laughs> the strange reactions people give are just, it really kind of turns us off from wanting to tell people, or they tell us we're crazy, or insane, or ridicule us because we refuse to deny what we know is true. We've all learned our lesson with that, I'm sure. So we're not hiding the information. People are hiding it from themselves. <laughs> Personally, as a few of you have heard me say already, I think we're more like the UFO community. And the reason I say that, when they began, they were told everything they were looking into was crazy, and they should stop. And my favorite, that's impossible. That can't happen. They didn't give up, though. Why? Because they knew something that other people did not know and refused to to not look at it. They refused to turn the other cheek and just not even pay attention to what was going on or what they experienced themselves. To those people who had witnessed the UFO or an abduction event, to those people it's as real as me standing here talking to you guys right now. There's no difference. Just as real as that we know the Berenstein Bears had an E or whatever the Mandela effect that gets you. <laughs> the Berenstein shirt, I like that. <laughs> Year in and year out, the government and the media would paint them in a horrible light. They would call them conspiracy theorists, tinfoil hat kooks, or flat out be called delusional by some and crazy by others. Yet year after year, they would meet together to share their experiences, share their evidences, and prove that what they were saying was true. After eight decades, they are finally being vindicated by both our government and the media. But of course, this isn't about UFOs, is it? This is about the Mandela Effect. So what does that have to do with the first question that I asked? Well, aren't we all told the same things that we're crazy or conspiracy theorists? Or again, my favorite, that's impossible. The reason it's so important that you guys take part in this weekend is because you have a chance to be in the company of those who see the world a lot like you do. We might not all agree on the same effects, but we can all agree that something supernatural is going on, and we can't explain it with logic and, and science as it is today. Though some of my speakers might beg to differ on that. <laughs> but even more importantly, is there are those who were desperate to come to this event, and were not able to. So the ones that are here are extremely lucky. And we're so very thankful to have each and every one of you. So whether you are at home, part of the community, or here, you are all a representative of this community. And as such, you should wear that like a badge of honor, in my opinion. You represent those in this world who see that something is wrong and have been, had no one with whom they could talk to about it. So please, thoroughly enjoy all that we have to offer this weekend. And know that for at least a few days, you are not alone in this reality. Thank you.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker this evening knows more about this than probably anybody in this room. She has studied the effects of time manipulation, time travel, time vortexes, and all the things dealing with time for probably 20 plus years, correct? Yes, ma'am. She is the best selling author of six books who helps people visualize and access whole new worlds of possibility. She hosts Living the Quantum Dream on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. She's been featured on the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, Coast to Coast AM, and the BBC. She's presented papers at international conferences on science, spirituality, and consciousness. As an organizer, she's also been an instrumental part of pulling together this amazing conference for you guys. Since 1999, she has shared findings from scientific research in the fields of quantum physics, quantum biology, the placebo effect, positive psychology, sociology, and alternative medicine. Her articles have appeared in journals ranging from Cosmos and History to Magical Blend and Parabola. Results from her Do You Reality Shift surveys conducted in 2000 and June of 2013 document incidents of the most commonly experienced types of reality shifts. And her Reality Shifters website has compiled one of the most extensive collection of reality shift reports in the entire world. Her e-zine, Reality Shifters, is eagerly awaited each month by thousands of subscribers worldwide. She has a degree in physics from UC Berkeley, an MBA degree, and a doctor of divinity. She reminds us to ask in every situation, how good can it get? Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our keynote speaker, Miss Cynthia Sue Larson. <laughs> Thank you so much. Such an honor to be here, and thank you, Jerry, for having the dream to make this come true. So when Jerry invited me to be part of this, I was overwhelmed with this feeling of, wow, this is finally happening. We have reached a tipping point in the world, really, where this topic has come to the forefront for a lot of people. And many of us who are here today have come, as Jerry said, a long way. And he has, I have as well. So my talk, the title is The Science and History of Reality Shifts and Mandela Effects. But I'll be starting um, by talking very much about my own worldview and from my own perspective. Each of us has a very individual experience of reality. It's very subjective in contrast to what modern science would have you believe, that there's one objective physical truth in reality. That's a philosophy. That's not really what science should be all about. So I'll be telling you a little bit about my background. Um, as Jerry pointed out, um, some of my curricula here is on this visual. I was born aware, which simply means that I remembered a blissful state of conscious, pure essence before I was born. It was so good, I really didn't want to be here. That's how good it is. I mean, it is amazing. So do I believe in heaven? Yes, I really do. Um, so I came in that way, and it, as you might imagine, being here is a shock. It, it's absolutely a shock. It's hard to be here. It was for me as a young child. I'm not going to talk too much about that. I'm just going to keep moving on. I, I mean, I've been working on this field for so long, but I want you to know that I come from a sort of a, a different perspective, if you want to look at it that way. I've got the degrees that Jerry mentioned, a physics degree from UC Berkeley. I've got physicists um, who are still there, who know about my work, and privately, are thrilled with it and really understand it. Publicly, it's still hard to come forward and acknowledge that some of these things are actually happening. And I'm talking world famous theoretical physicists. Um, I had a Kundalini experience in 1994 when I was 32 years old, and that absolutely woke me up to a level of not being able to discount and dismiss a lot of uh, what I know to be true. So that was the year. That I, if I want to look at a, a point where things really changed for me, that was the year where I felt like, okay, I have to be a lot more public uh, than I've ever been up to that point uh, about what I know the nature of reality to be. I've written the books that uh, were mentioned, published the newsletter. I've been creating YouTube videos since 2009. I've been helping to organize and run Foundations of Mind scientific conferences since 2014, and so forth. Okay. 
Let's t uh, this is the key points of my talk tonight, but first there's a cartoon. There's a woman, uh, I think it's a woman doing the laundry. She says, where did all these extra socks come from? And the caption underneath says, meanwhile, in a parallel universe. So this is where the field was when I started in it 20 years ago. It was sort of a joke, like where do the socks go? And um, you know, how come I put my keys down and they're not where I thought I put them, that kind of thing. So I'll be talking about my life with reality shifts, um, talking about the Mandela Effect overview, talking about what's going on, which this is a whole weekend that we'll get to look at that, and talking about quantum phenomena, an overview, and then quantum logic and processes. So this is a picture of me when I was very young. <laughs> I was about three years old. So I'm going to start, um, I, as I mentioned, I, I came in blissed out with this feeling of heaven, basically. The person who got me the most and understood that was my grandmother, a devout Lutheran. And when she passed away, the minister said, I've never met anyone with more faith than she had. And thank God for her, because um, that really gave me a grounding, a rootedness to be able to do all I've been doing so far. Just the knowledge that God is real, that um, so. But I was raised by an atheist, so that's OK, too. You know, I, I don't have anything against any religion or any spiritual path. So when I was very young, about age five, I envisioned reality as a web of consciousness. And I saw that I was here to help with the raising of that. It, I've got a picture of a cobweb there with dew drops. It kind of looked like that. I didn't know about Indra's web, but that's pretty much what it looks like. Um, and then about the same time, I was five years old, I noticed that I was getting very strong mind matter interface intervention kind of things going on. So I could watch it raining and I could think stop rain, it would stop. I could think start, it would start. I had the innocence of a child, the purity of heart and just that faith. And I would get instantaneous effects in nature all the time. When I was young, I showed my mother, I said, I thought this is so cool, I wanna show someone. So I got my mom, I said, come and take a look at this. And then the effect stopped and that's when I, I mean, it was hard to be on this planet, frankly, <laughs> when you've got that kind of purity of heart. But thank goodness for this Mandela Effect community, because what I'm saying is a lot of us are coming to this point now where we're starting to get those kind of effects. Other things that I would do after I went private with it, no more telling people about it, is like if the car didn't start, that's a picture of the car we had. It's an old Chevrolet. Um, that's a TV console like the one we had. And these things would go on the fritz and break down rather often compared to what things do nowadays. <laughs> but I could just um, love whatever it was very much and hear the sound of the engine starting, it would start. Or my, my dad was working with the tubes inside the tube television. And he, when he starts swearing, it's like, okay, things are getting bad. I better just feel how much I love that television and then it would work. But if I didn't say anything, so I was not talking about this. Um, I, my family traveled all the time. We would go to places where they'd never seen white people before. That's a very big part of my life. So I was constantly going around the world to sacred sites uh, that, where I could feel the energy and I was getting the benefit of it and seeing amazing things. This trip, I'm just highlighting it here, in the 1970s, we were in Kashmir, uh, staying on a houseboat in Doll Lake that looks so beautiful. And my parents had purchased some custom-made furniture, such as what you see there. And they'd made, they, I heard them promise the wood carvers, when we finish building the new house we're building, we'll take pictures of the furniture in the beautiful library that they're building and send it back. So I thought, cool, that's nice of them to promise that. So they finished building the house, built the library, put the furniture in. And I kept waiting, when are they going to take the pictures and send it back to the wood carvers? And then I couldn't stand it anymore. I had to ask them, well, when are you going to take the pictures? They, didn't, they said, what pictures? And I said, the ones you promised to the wood carvers that you take. We never made any promise like that. And my parents weren't lying, but it was, that was a real amazing moment for me to see. We've got two very different histories. I didn't argue or press the point, but I thought, wow, this is big. <clears throat> Another big one for me in the 70s, when I was a teenager, I heard a radio an, um, announcer on a pop ra radio station announce, now we're going to play a brand new song that we've never played before. 
I thought, oh, cool. And then I heard it, and it was something I was so sick of hearing because I'd heard it so many times. And I, I, I thought, there's something wrong with me, or maybe I'm confused. I don't know the name of the song because it's so long ago now, but I did ask my sister and my best friends, and to them it was a new song. They didn't know what I was talking about. But these are early experiences. <clears throat> um, I had an experience of meeting my future self in my bedroom one night. She, um, she, she just walked out of the floor-to-ceiling mirrors, um, my closet mirrors, and walked across the room telepathically communicating with me, but I spoke out loud I'd, to the point that my father came to check on me because he heard me talking to someone. What she did is she walked over to my desk, opened the lower left drawer, removed something, closed the drawer, talked to me some more. I'm talking to her, and she left. And then my dad came in, what's going on? I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I thought I was dreaming, like this is too weird. And so the next morning um, I checked my dresser and there were some letters missing. And I, I accused my sister of having stolen them, and she got very upset, like I didn't steal them. So that was interesting. To this day, I've not yet gone back in time to my knowledge and retrieved those letters. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just interesting. So I've had some interesting experiences. This is um, my first Alive Again experience, was with my roommate's cat. Um, he was Ashes, and I was living with Ashes and Catherine on Cedar Street in Berkeley in an apartment. I moved across the street to a new apartment, and this kitty cat would come and visit me. And one day, my old roommate Catherine told me some bad news, that Ashes had been hit by a car and died. And so uh, that was terrible. I felt like I hadn't really said goodbye, and it was too soon to lose him. You know when you become attached to a beloved pet? And he felt like my pet. He was part of the family when I lived there. But then a while later, he visited me in the garden across the street. It was definitely him. He was a little greasy, kind of like he wasn't washing too well, <laughs> but it was him. And that was pretty amazing. Um, I've had an interesting experience with time. I'm kind of doing a highlights of some bizarre experiences that I've had that I know are real. And then we'll get into the Mandela effect. But this one was where time came to a stop. This is the summer of 1991. I was living in Lausanne, Switzerland, and we were living there for about nine months. The train station has a very hard floor, kind of like marble, and the people dress, the ladies dress elegantly. They're often wearing, you know, wearing high heels. So you can hear that click, click, click on the floor. Um, my daughter was traveling on my husband's shoulders. He, had, um, he was not holding onto her legs like usual because he had his suitcase and her suitcase. She was holding onto his hair, until she let go and started flapping her hands like this and started arching her back and going backwards. At that point, it was terrifying for me. I also um, had heavy suitcase, but, um, but I was about six feet behind them. So what I did is, um, well, you know, when you're a mother, you, you, there's nothing you can do at that point. I just wanted to catch her in my arms. That's what I pictured. What happened next was I heard the sounds of the train station just drop. It went from the click, 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 high-pitched noise, went to ooh, just like low, as everything slowed down, including her falling. And I could move at regular speed and catch her, and it was extraordinary. And I know that happened. That wasn't me imagining that time slowed to a stop. That happened. And okay, now this is really cool. This is definitely very much like the Mandela effects we're seeing today. This was 1994. And I went to a conference. This was um, in London, England. And it wasn't my conference. It was my husband's conference. And he was talking about software that he was designing. But what was interesting is, on the program, there was going to be a speaker from an architectural firm called Ove Arup. And I noticed that because it was the, one of the biggest architectural firms in London. And that was exciting. But then um, at the break, the presenter was no longer on the program at all. He had just completely vanished. And um, I checked with my husband, don't you remember there was someone supposed to be here from Ove Arup? And my husband said yes. His, name, his first name was Steve. I can't remember the last name because it just vanished. Suddenly he was no longer on the program. Nobody from that architectural firm was. And here's one of my first celebrities that was alive again. Uh, I mentioned this one in my book, Reality Shifts. This is Larry Hagman. You know him from I Dream of Jeannie and from Dallas. And what I saw was he'd passed away um, 
back around 1997. But then he was alive again um, in just the next year. And I know that for sure. But this is, again, remember, this is before we had this community on the internet where we could talk about these things. And so it was just one of those weird things, like, well, there's another one. <laughs> this is very strange. Um, so I've also, um, just in the realm of strange paranormal, I have been witnessed bilocating on a couple of occasions. And from my point of view, I was daydreaming. On one occasion, it was a cold morning in my house. And I'm, I usually would wake my daughters up when they were very young. But that morning, I thought, it's so cold, I'm just going to stay in bed for a little bit more. And um, the other time was when I was feeling cooped up indoors at a book event. So here's a picture of my daughters in their bedroom. This was in the 1990s, and this is when they were awake. So I was daydreaming that um, I'm just going to, it's kind of like you think you're going to do it, and you're going to will yourself to get up. But instead of sort of walking down the hall, I'm flipping on their light. I'm opening their heavy curtain in their room that they can't lift. But then a few minutes later, after daydreaming this, my daughters came, I could hear them running down the hall to me. And they said, what are you doing back in bed? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, uh, why are you back in bed? They just didn't understand it. And I said, well, who woke you up? You did. I'm like, what? <laughs> then I'm up out of bed. And I go to their room, the light's on and the curtain's up. They could not do this themselves. And there was no other adult in the house. Uh, and then the other bilocation was daydreaming at that book event. I was cooped up indoors on a gorgeous day, looking out the window and wishing I was outside. I was daydreaming. I was walking down this street, Solano, with trees. And, and a friend of mine saw me, Katrina, and she said, what were you doing walking down the street when I know she knew I was supposed to be at a book event? <laughs> and I said, wow. Well, I asked her, where did you see me? And she said, on Solano. I said, what time? And it was exactly when I was daydreaming about it. Okay, now, this is, the, um, this is the original cover of the first version of my book, Reality Shifts. Um, when I told my friends in the 1990s about these reality shifts, two of my best friends who used to work at Citibank with me, high-level managers there, I was asking them, have you ever seen this sort of thing happen? Where something just shows up out of nowhere, like it's been there all the time. And they said um, they weren't sure what I meant. As they said that, here was something that we had never seen that just showed up out of nowhere. <laughs> And I said, like this. And this sundial sculpture, it's interesting it's a sundial because that represents time and space. So this was one of the big ones that first showed up for me. And it was in a place which blocks the view of another statue. So um, it was just very obvious that it was, had never been there before, but now it is. And I called the harbor master. This was at the Berkeley Marina. The harbor master's official story was, this has always been here, just like what you hear nowadays when you research Mandela effects. Same thing. I've witnessed instantaneous healing. So many examples of it. Uh, massive, amazing examples of it. And as Dr. Larry Dossi would tell you, um, this, people try to put this stuff down as anecdotal evidence, but really, these are case studies. These are actual experiences. My grandmother's liver cancer vanished. I had a friend's broken bones instantly healed. Our family dog's cataracts vanished. Um, my daughter had a shattered bone that looked like an explosion had gone off. It completely healed. Um, I had a friend come out of a coma and blood blisters and burns have instantly healed. So here's a picture of my grandmother. This was 1998. She had inoperable liver cancer and she was getting quite elderly so the doctors didn't want to do anything. And they gave her just a few months to live. They said, you know, um, and she kept it a secret from a lot of us. This is the one who's so spiritual. This is my grandmother that had more faith than most ministers have. Amazing, beautiful, spirited woman. And um, so she had been told that she only had a few months to live, but she didn't want to ruin our holidays. So she didn't really tell very many people till after the holidays. And then she just prayed to have courage to face whatever came next. So here's what came next, <laughs> complete vanishing of the liver cancer. My father is an electrical engineer, civil engineer, actually. And what he was um, surprised by is that they, he had seen the x-rays. He'd seen, you know, they had everything. They had tissue samples. They had all kinds of proof, blood tests, CAT scans, everything. Complete vanishing of her cancer is what occurred. And so... It was just very bizarre for someone who's got that view of reality is this way to witness something like that. To me, it made perfect sense um, because I had seen a lot of things changing. 
This is uh, one of my good friends, Susan, and I tell her story in my book, Quantum Jumps. She was camping and jumping from boulder to boulder when she broke her leg at Joshua Tree National Park. And uh, when we talked on the phone, uh, I, I reminded her that she had once seen me put my hand over a cut, an open wound, and I took my hand away, and it was healed. And I said, well, a bone is the same thing. It doesn't really matter what it is. You can just, you know, basically pray for just receiving that healing energy and go to that reality where you're fine. And as we're talking, she felt it starting to get itchy, and I said, that's a very good sign. And sure enough, her cancer vanished. Uh, excuse me, her bro broken bone vanished. Um, I'm looking at my dog picture, too. Um, I've got two stories here. So the, uh, the picture of the dog, that's our family dog, Susan's Hugging. That's Prince Moonshadow. And back in 2014, his um, eyes were glazing over with cataracts. And so when I first saw that, I thought, no, we don't want our dog to get cataracts. We love him. And then it went away from me. And then um, I was approached next by... Um, my husband and then my daughter and we went through the same conversations basically I'd explain well sometimes it looks like he has cataracts that can happen but then we don't want the cataracts we love our dog and you know and then they go away and that went away three times and he never got cataracts again so and then my friend with the broken bone that healed the doctors didn't know what had happened that was a weird one and it was hard for her to explain why she took all that time off to heal something that didn't need fixing when she's starting a new job, it was a little awkward, but it was good. Okay, here is my daughter who had the shattered leg. Um, and the doctors said that this, they showed me the x-rays and said, look at the, it looks like an explosion went off. The, this bone is not going to knit properly. It can't heal. There's no way all those little pieces and little miniature shards can possibly come back together. What you're, you'll get is a bone mass blob and one le that leg will be shorter. She's very young, so that's what's going to happen. And I said, did you say any of this to her? And they said, no. And I said, don't. <laughs> Do not say this to her. So then we just worked every night on just loving her leg, and it healed perfectly. And here's a friend that had a coma. This is Chris. And um, I was praying for his recovery, but I would sense things happening with him that there's no way I could have known, such as um, when there was pain around his heart, when he was intubated with his throat, um, they did a little thing so he could breathe, and the emergency heart surgery. Um, so I even felt him lose his will to live. When that happened, that was, that was a doozy. It's like, okay, I was telling my, her, his sister, my best friend Lisa, I said, wow, this is not good. He's losing his will to live. We need to help him. This is going to take extra special prayer because this is big. So we just prayed that he'd regain the will to live. I could feel that happen. He felt it happen. Um, then he had some amazing things happen when he came out of the coma. And there was Sister Claire, an Irish Catholic nun beside him praying, and he could see her glowing. So that was very cool. And um, my younger daughter here, she got a blood blister from doing the monkey bars. And so um, I helped her just heal those huge, angry blood blisters by just putting my hands around her hand, feeling lots of love for her. Took my hands away, and she's all better. And she asks me, is this what your mother used to do for you? And I said, no. And I described that weird mercurochrome red stuff. <laughs> and she looked at me like, what is that? I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> Funny. OK. So um, time loops are especially interesting. I want to talk about that with my life with reality shifts. And of course, Jerry mentioned it briefly. This is a huge subject, uh, so I'm just going to go into it a little bit. But I want people to understand that when it comes to time loops, there are cultures on this planet that know about them and have words for them and accept them as a normal part of everyday life, such as the Norwegian word vardiager. And that's a premonitory sound or sight of a person before he arrives and the Finnish etienin, or I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly. I do have both Norwegian and Finnish heritage, so maybe, I don't know if that helps in experiencing these things, but I did witness sequences of repeating events. So here's a picture of a conference um, facility that I went to, the Crown Plaza Hotel in Albuquerque. There was a science and consciousness conference there in 2001 in April, and I was talking to a woman about these kinds of reality shifts, and as it was having this discussion, we both witnessed a woman come out of the parking lot into the lobby 
and walk past us. We didn't know her. But then uh, we kept talking. A few minutes later, the same woman came the same way out of the parking lot, past us, and moved on through. And at that point, I said, wait a minute. You know, this is exactly what we're talking about, these kind of time shifts. And so I stopped the woman who was walking through and asked, did you go through before? And she said, no. She didn't know what I was talking about. But my, it was nice to have another witness. So there were at least two of us that's, that for sure recognized, yes, this just did happen. And another, um, the Vardiegger thing where you hear someone before they arrive happened to me uh, a couple of times. One of them, the front door was slightly ajar. This is the front door. And I could hear my daughter and her friends showing up. And I could hear their voices. And I, I was in the kitchen. I said, I'll be right with you guys. But then I went to check, and there was no one there. But then, then they showed up about 20 minutes later. So another kind of a circuitous, circular kind of a time situation going on. OK, so for the history of reality shifts, we need to give credit to PMH Atwater. She's the first person in this reality who has coined the term reality shifts. And it was in her book, Future Memory, in 1995. She has a whole chapter dedicated to it. And it's exactly the way that I've been talking about reality shifts. I didn't know this at the time, um, but I was just thinking of a word or a phrase to describe what are we witnessing. In 1998, this is a few years after that Kundalini experience I had where I felt like I can't hide this anymore. I'm going to have to go public as embarrassing as this is. <laughs> when there was no Mandela Effect community, it's like, I'm going to have to go public with this <laughs> and tell people about this, really? So yes, so I started um, the first issue of Reality Shifters featured Uri Geller. He came to San Francisco in October 24th, 1999. I've got a bunch of pictures of him um, doing the spoon bending, sprouting of seeds, mind matter inter interference and interaction going on. And basically, I, I was delighted to see someone had been doing this also, although more like a parlor performance kind of a thing, but still acknowledging this is real. I think the first recorded recognition of Mandela, Nelson Mandela, being alive again, I think we need to give credit to Art Bell, because in April of 2001, he said he'd received maybe a 1,000 emails so far from people who remember history a very different way. I'm getting an awful lot of emails saying, Art, I remember that it happened this way, not the way it really has happened. And so. I think it's kind of interesting that it takes time for these things to catch on. So there, if you're in a hurry and you feel like I just hit the Mandela effect and why isn't everybody waking up, keep in mind that was 2001. That was 18 years ago. So sometimes it's, it takes a while. I'm hoping that we can get more people to recognize it, but it's a process. Um, in Reality Shifters, I've heard from people reporting Jane Goodall having died in 1985. And I remember Benicio del Toro. He died around 2001. I think both of them are still alive right now, I hope. Um, they're both really great people, seem to be. I did a survey in July 2005 just to find out who are people noticing being alive again? Who are the celebrities? It tends to be celebrities because those are people that we're all kind of peripherally aware of. At that time, Bob Keeshan, who played Captain Kangaroo, and was reported by a little over a quarter of the respondents. Jane Goodall was another popular choice. And if you're thinking, well, they got her mixed up with Diane Fossey, I don't think so. Uh, because the reason I was so upset about Jane Goodall was precisely because first Diane Fossey had died, and then Jane Goodall also murdered. That's what I remember. And it was just like this, I was like, wait a minute, this can't be happening. This is too weird, and it's not acceptable. And then the next thing I know, wow, she's alive. That's good. Larry Hagman, 15%. Bob Hope, at that time, I guess he was still alive, 2005, 10%. Jack Palance, B. Arthur, Ed Asner, Walter Cronkite, and Mariel Hemingway. So um, that's just a sampling to give you an idea. This effect has been around for quite a while. OK, so the Mandela effect itself is famous, of course, for Nelson Mandela. And um, you know when he was born in 1918, but what do you remember in terms of when did he die? And that's an individual thing. Uh, but some of us, myself included, do remember Nelson Mandela died decades ago. 
And I'm glad it's not that way now. But I do remember that he was still incarcerated on Robben Island. This is a picture of him it's confined to that small cell, keeping such a brave face. Uh, but there was all this turbulence after he passed. It, it wasn't the thing at all about the way he passed more recently. It's so much better now. But this was um, a, a very dark time. So the official current history, thank goodness, shows that Nelson Mandela died December 5th, 2013. And it was very peaceful, people lighting candles, remembering his long, wonderful legacy for human rights and for the world. I've done a study to show the Mandela Effect trends using the Google Analytics. And this is a graph that shows a spike. And you can see that um, even though the Mandela Effect term was coined in around 2010 by Fiona Broom, it didn't really break through to public awareness, according to the Google search engine, until about 2016. So when you hear people say, this is pretty new for me in the last few years, that's really, we're seeing that. It really is true. This, pic, this is packing a whole bunch of Mandela effects on one page. And what's interesting about this, just take a look if you can see it. I hope it shows up. I can read some of them. There's Berenstein Bears or Berenstein Bears. Um, there's What If I Told You Everything You Knew Was a Lie from The Matrix. There's a Haas Avocado on the upper right, spelled the way I remember it. It's from California. You know? <laughs> Two A's. Why else would you call it Haas? You know? <laughs> Oh, you know, all these examples, you've got the tail on the, the little monkey, the Curious George. Star Wars is a big one for me. You've got C-3PO in the bottom left with supposedly not all gold. He's got a silver leg. And um, I remember Stouffer's stovetop stuffing. I, I don't know what happened to that. And of course, the lion and the lamb. I think our other speakers are going to talk a lot more about this. So I, I'm just putting this up here because what you're seeing on this page None of these are the current official history. So if any of those look right, then that's something to think about. Because what we're seeing is everything here is, you know, people would tell you it's a lie. We don't have Jiffy peanut butter. There were never were the Berenstein Bears, even though that's how people pronounce it. And why would they do that if it was always Berenstein? Uh, you've got geography briefly mentioned. We'll have people talking about that this weekend. So again, this is just a sampler. So you get the idea that this is huge. I think we're getting an explosion of thousands of these Mandela effects. There are sites tracking them, and it's, it's just amazing. So you can ask yourself, which bear family do you remember? Well, I remember the Berenstein bears. I know, I know. It's like horrible. <laughs> it's hard to see them side by side, yes. OK. And I remember, this is a weird one. I just put it up because some people are, they like literature. I remember something different than what has currently supposedly always been true. What sounds right to you? This is the Oscar Wilde book. Would you remember the portrait of Dorian Gray? Or the picture of Dorian Gray? Which one sounds right? The portrait. Well, it's now always only ever been the picture of Dorian Gray. And I'm not sure what that's about, but that's interesting. And then it gets really interesting. I was fascinated by this um, story out of England. Um, I followed it in one of my blog posts because sometimes you'll notice an entire town is divided about what they remember. And this affected a town in England called a town of Bolton. They had um, meetings about this topic. It was so heated because the newspaper even did a poll to find out what do people remember. Half of the, vill the villagers remember that there was a large dinosaur back in the 1960s that had always been prominently displayed at the very opening of the natural history part of their museum. And the other half of the people didn't quite remember that. But um, it, it made people wonder, why do we think that that was the case? Where would this memory have come from if it wasn't true? So to me, it sounds like another case very clearly of the Mandela effect. We're now seeing the mainstream media increasingly covering the topic, I think due to the fact that more and more people are acknowledging it and no longer dismissing it out of hand. Um, but let's talk about false media, uh, false Mandela effects. This does happen when people think that there might have been a Mandela effect when actually 
it was a case of a logo changing, like NBC's logo has definitely moved and uh, changed over the years. It's been modified. Genuine Mandela effects are often, the, uh, you'll see them in the form of art, either someone's sketch, painting, drawing, their journal notes. And that's because when you've done something yourself and you've drawn it and you painted it, then it's kind of like part of you interacting with it and it's very much, it's a record of your subjective experience. And so that's showing you something that that was the way that that person did remember it. Flip-flops are fascinating to me. This, I'm showing one that happened um, at my neighbor's house next door. I would look across the house next door and sometimes they had a leaf guard that prevented leaves from getting caught in the gutter. Other times they didn't. And it would kind of go back and forth. And it, was, it was kind of fascinating and weird. <laughs> like, okay, what's going on with that? And then also the other example that I mentioned earlier was our dog having cataracts and sometimes not. And it does help if you're observing realities with people who are friendly, supportive of what you're observing, and choosing with you. This is just a bizarre picture. Um, it's, it's just to show something surreal. I think we are glimpsing other possible realities. And so this picture showing a giraffe joining people at the breakfast table, um, this is just showing us that what you believe po it to be possible is more likely to be something you can experience. So to the degree that you're open-minded, you'll actually be able to witness more things. And to the degree that you're kind of closing it in, that's going to narrow what you'll be able to observe. Okay, so what is happening? This is where I think it's interesting to talk about, and we'll have lots of conversations this weekend about it. And what I'd like you to think about are four top contenders that I hear a lot about. Um, maybe it's because of the scientific community that I hear from a lot. Number one, we're living in a computer simulation. That's the idea that's kind of got glitches in it, and sometimes, you know, there's a glitch in the matrix. Number two, people have false memories. It's confabulation. People get misguided. Something reminds them of something, and that's why we got, um, you know, Biko mixed up with Mandela. We got uh, Jane Goodall mixed up with Diane Fossey. I know that's not true, but a lot of people think that's all that it is. Um, number three, scientists at CERN are tampering with reality or perhaps some other um, cyclotron. <laughs> there are others. Number four, quantum phenomena occur at, a very, at every scale, small to large. So these are uh, four possible explanations. And so let's take a look at number one. If we're living in a simulation with glitches, uh, this, one of our top pro proponents of this theory is Elon Musk. And he likes to uh, announce that, there's, that the chance that we are um, not living in a simulation is one in billions. I think that takes a lot of um, um, chutzpah to say that. <laughs> I mean, really. But anyway, um, he thinks that there will be computing technology that will soon be indistinguishable from real life. I don't know what real life he's talking about, but um, again, uh, maybe that's his reality. Okay. Yet, I, I would say that the qualities of our life experiences, to me, feel so much richer more joyful and more meaningful than anything that you can get from a computer simulation. To me, real nature and really interacting with wild animals, with other people, with um, just that, that level of participation that you get, I don't think you get that from a computer program. And I have worked in information technology. Those are some of my earliest jobs working. I did work at Space Sciences. I programmed in about four or five different languages. So um, I, I do know what I'm talking about. I'm not just saying this randomly. Um, I really think that there's a difference. So this is a joke. Um, on the right, you'll see a digital billboard in Odessa, and it malfunctioned in the fog. So I don't think you can quite see it, but that's the Windows 98 fail message. You know, it's kind of like, um, so it convinced unknown numbers of individuals, not only were they living in the matrix, but it was being run on Windows 98. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I think that's kind of silly. Um, you know, the kind of glitches you'd get would be different than the kind of things we're seeing. A lot of what we're seeing is making more sense, and we'll have a talk about that this weekend, too. So what is being simulated? What is base reality? Uh, I, th I think that's the key to this whole simulation thing. People think, like, oh, they're done. It's a computer simulation. We solved it. It's over. Ha-ha, <laughs> done. But really, it's not done. So what are you simulating? What is this wonderful thing? You know, who is in that control room? 
operating all of it. What is this real reality? So they haven't really solved it. They just pushed the, you know, the dirt under the carpet. Theory two, shared false memories and confabulation. People sometimes have defective memories is the idea here. And people get suggestible. Um, you'll see magicians demonstrate this. They'll be able to get people to draw a certain card or say something. They know how to do that. But it doesn't really make sense about why so many of us would r agree on all these details. And, uh, and it wouldn't really explain the flip-flops either. So there are a lot of things that don't really make sense. But if you start looking at human decision and cognition models, such as um, with this fabulous theorist named Jerome Busemeyer, and I've interviewed him on my show, Living the Quantum Dream, um, he says in his book that he co-authored with Peter Bruza, and that's the, the cover of the book, Quantum Models of Cognition and Decision. He says, the wave nature of an indefinite state captures the psychological experience of conflict, ambiguity, confusion, and uncertainty. And boy, does it. I mean, if you're in it, it can be very, very unsettling. It's, it, it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable always to be in that state. So we don't like it. The particle nature of a definite state captures the psychological experience of conflict resolution, decision, and certainty. So you can see right there why people would prefer to believe. Um, let's just stick with material realism. Let's say there's only one reality. You know, let's believe in this fairy tale of objectivity and you know, the things that can be materially true only. Something that I mentioned in my book, Quantum Jumps, is called flashbulb memories. And here, you'll see the example of the Challenger space shuttle explosion. Um, that was a moment in time when some psychologists thought, perfect opportunity. We'll ask all of the psychology students to write down where were you, what were you doing, who were you with, how did you find out about this calamity. And so this, the students wrote that down in their own handwriting, turned it into the professors, and then a little while, like a year or two later, the professors hand, um, asked the same question again, because this is a great opportunity. Now, what do, where do you think you were? Who were you with? What were you doing? How did you find out? And, um, and then they got their original papers back, and several of the students said, um, that's my handwriting, but that's not what happened. And that's interesting, too. So it's kind of very cool. OK, theory three, scientists at CERN are tampering with reality. And some wonder if strange goings on might be happening at the Large Hadron Collider. You'll see conspiracy theories about the logo for CERN with the 666 and so forth and all sorts of things, um, saying that scientists opened a portal, created a black hole, or ripped a tear in the fabric of space. And you know maybe they did. I don't know. I, I, I know a lot of particle physicists, so I would have to tell you these people are the farthest people from doing anything like that that you'd probably ever want to meet. Um, they're very focused on what they're doing. But anyway, um, my feeling is that consciousness, including God, is always going to be greater than all of that. That's my opinion. So I, I think that um, based on what I've seen, what I've witnessed, my own experiences. So I would say, um, and then here's a picture of some particle physicists. Do they look to you like the type that are you know, dancing with goats and having blood rituals. I don't think so. Um, maybe, maybe these people are being directed by dark forces, but even so, God is greater. So, theory four. This is the one that I've been proposing most often in my writing, in my books and articles. Um, but even here, if you go far enough, you'll see consciousness plays the role. So this is the idea that macroscopic scale quantum phenomena is occurring. And I believe this is true. I believe that our reality is primarily quantum, and, and the classical scale is, is a subset, a very special case subset. I know you can derive all of quantum physics from six simple postulates, which proves that you can do that. You can say, like, OK, this is the whole world as we can conceive of it, not what matters to us, not love, not consciousness, not how you know that you're real. I mean, science can't really do that. But um, if you look at quantum physics, you'll notice that all of the strange quantum behavior is occurring at every single level of reality. Just hit the wrong button. There we go. Oh, hello again. OK, now I'm going to give some examples of what I mean. So when you see a, a flip-flop, which it, here's a picture from my book, Reality Shifts, where one morning I hadn't changed the bird feeder, but I just came out at two different points in time, and the levels of the bird feed was dramatically different. 
this would definitely indicate that we can see examples of quantum superposition. That this is something that you'd expect to see occasionally. That two different states of the bird feeder might be observable if you're open-minded to observing it. Because you've come to this conference or heard about the Mandela effect or whatever. Um, most all instances of Mandela effects change simultaneously. This is a big part of quantum physics. It's called entanglement. So when systems are entangled, such as your families and people you care about, you tend to usually agree on most things. There's a level of collective consciousness going on. Here's a picture of my um, childhood lunchbox. I remember Charles Schultz was spelled differently than it currently is. <laughs> I used to stare at this lunchbox every day. And it did have a T in it, but now it's just Schultz. So seeing people nodding too. It, this was a big one for me personally, because every day I would look at that lunchbox. <laughs> And that's kind of weird. So, but with quantum entanglement, the reason that you get everything changing all at once is because it's all entangled together. It's very much a part of quantum physics. Um, you would expect to see instantaneous telepathic communication, also because of quantum entanglement. And th these are books by Rupert Sheldrake, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. This is a scientist who has actually proven that this is true. Another great researcher was Cleve Baxter, who wrote a book, Primary Perception, also talking about similar topics. And here's my friend and great researcher and great physicist, Henry Stapp. Um, doctors would not necessarily witness physiological Mandela effects. Why would that be? And it's due to the quantum Zeno effect. So it's, it means that when you're close to something, you're going to be, like if you have obsessive compulsive disorder, kind of, and you're check, 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 checking something, because you're working with it every single day, for you, it's going to be locking that system into that state. You're locking it in. And so, of course, that's going to be true, whereas people that don't work with it would not notice it. Uh, Retrocausality, time travel, that's a very natural part of, qu of quantum physics. And here's the organizer of a time travel research conference, David Sheehan. And he says, to say that it's impossible for the future to influence the past is to deny half of the predictions of the laws of physics. So there we go. You may think that's far out, but um, quantum physics denies a singular history in, you know, of facts. There's no way that that could be true. Uh, people being teleported to safety is one of the top most closeted things going on right now. When I give talks, I'll have people come to me privately and admit I was teleported to safety. I went through, a car was coming right at me, and the next thing I know, my vehicle was on the other side of it. They, they feel embarrassed to say these things because they know people are going to say, you're crazy, that couldn't have happened. Well, it's happening a lot. So it's good for people to know it is happening. And it can be life-saving quite often. So um, this is interesting. Um, the cover of my book, Quantum Jumps, used to have a section explaining why this is the cover. I, um, in the process of getting ready for this conference, I spent maybe three, four hours looking for where I wrote that in the book. It is gone. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Welcome to the wild, wild, wonderful world of Mandela Effect. So um, what, what's going on with this? Uh, you'll see the illustration. And I put our beautiful logo there because to me it's very similar. I feel like what we're witnessing is just this uh, here, the next slide should explain what is not in the book. Entangled black holes can be pathways through the multiverse. They can be very small. And so what you're seeing is the possibility for something on an astronomical scale to be tied with a quantum property. And we have researchers proving this. Um, Leonard Susskind and Juan Maldacena postulate that wormholes, which are also called Einstein-Rosen bridges, can be viewed as entanglement between black holes. And then MIT's Julian Sonner shows that the creation of a pair of entangled quarks can give rise to a wormhole connecting the two of them. So you can get these things happening on a very small scale, and there can be a mechanical mechanism for what's going on, which people want to know. You know, they want that mechanism. Okay, going back to these four theories that I'm looking at tonight, um, when I look at all four of them, when you go to the bottom of each one, you end up at the same place. They're basically all taking us to consciousness. And what do we mean by that? Well, that's a whole other thing. So this is really a Mandela Effect conference, but to me, it's a consciousness conference also. 
And, it, and that would be in agreement with the founder of quantum physics, Max Planck, who said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. Okay, now we get into the history of this whole thing. How far back does this go? I've talked about it sort of occurring through my whole life. Um, so what I'm saying is this has been with us for a long time. This is a history of the universe kind of a chart, just to get us to think about that. Well, let's take a look at exceptional experiences of consciousness. Uh, this is extremely important. I started tonight by telling you that I'm born aware, that I remember a blissed out state of being, pure consciousness. That's extremely important. Who else shares that experience with me? These people do. Um, ET and UFO experiencers, lucid dream experiencers, uh, people who have mystical experiences, people who have near-death experiences, people who have out-of-body experiences, and people who have Mandela effect experiences. So this is something that um, is worth taking a look at. Characteristics of exceptional human experiences were documented by a scientist, Ray White, and she said that um, spontaneous, transcendent, new experience of self is all part of this. Um, that there are experiences of connection, there's a direct experience of reality. Sometimes there's no sense of separation whatsoever. You can get tingling and uh, rapid heartbeat. You can get swooning, raised hairs, goosebumps, breathlessness, all of these kinds of physiological things. So to be sentient, to shift reality, you can consider it operating outside of conditioning. Just deciding, we're going to be a little bit renegade here. <laughs> we're going to be a little bit different. And so when we do that, um, we're joining a very long tradition that goes back thousands of years. You may think that's never been the case. That's not true. We've had people thousands of years ago that have been documenting these kinds of things. These would be yogi masters martial arts masters, Nei Kung masters, Tibetan Buddhist masters, and shamans. So yoga masters, um, these would be practicing cities or supernormal abilities. And this is extremely well documented. Dean Radin wrote a book about it recently, Supernatural. And these people can demonstrate reality shifts such as biolocation, teleportation, materialization of objects, invisibility, weather changes, time travel, levitation, and more. And I've experienced most of those myself, so these are not made up fictitious things. These are real. Um, that's a picture of me with my martial arts master. Um, I practice martial arts. I like to focus my mind, bring my mind, body, spirit together. That's um, In Hyuk Su. He's the grandmaster of Kuk Sul Wan. And again, you see a younger picture of Henry Stapp up at the top. Um, he's there with another scientist, Helmut Schmidt. They together did some research to observe, could people affect something that has happened in the past? And they thought, well, that sounds kind of far out. Um, but Hen Henry Stapp is great because he likes to think about these things. He thinks, well, it should be possible. Quantum physics shows us it should be possible. Let's find out. Let's get some focused people. I wasn't part of that study because it happened you know, a long time ago, back in the 70s, but they found in replicated studies that these martial artists who were very focused could affect the random radioactive dis decay of an isotope that had occurred previously. What they were doing is just watching green and red lights and just kind of shifting it in a direction that, you know, green or red, no problem. But how is that possible? And so the, the conjecture there is that same thing that you saw at the time travel the retrocausality conference. Of course, it's an expected feature of quantum physics. Uh, Nei Kung masters, such as John Chang, he f was featured in a documentary on video. Um, he was called Dynamo Jack. He was seen to heal with his hands, catch a pellet from an air rifle in his hand without it going through. He pushed a chopstick through a tabletop, and here's a video of him starting fires with energy from his hands. And so this was in a documentary called Ring of Fire, really cool, about Indonesian energy masters. Tibetan meditation masters are similarly gifted with these abilities, and Tibetan Buddhists have been instructed to d disregard these kinds of shifts in reality because um, it can distract you from the spiritual path. But they're definitely saying that these things are happening. 
They're just saying, don't get obsessed with it. Don't make it part of your ego tonight. Jerry said, this is a great team uh, this weekend. I agree, because you're not getting people caught up in their ego, like, look how great I am. You know, look at me changing things. It's really not about that. And if you start making it about that, it's going to kind of go in a sideways direction. I met a Mongolian shaman, and um, his name is Zurigdapar Banzar. So this is a photo in 2004. And he spoke to a bunch of us. We authored a paper with him, uh, about him. We found, uh, magically found a translator that spoke Mongolian at this tiny conference, someone who just happened to be there who spoke Mongolian and stayed up late with us and found out that um, this Mongolian shaman believed that we need to be more connected with one another, that that's really what is necessary right now. And... Um, this is interesting to me that the Hopi Indians, I wrote an article called Comes True Being Hoped For for Parabola magazine. I was fascinated by two things. One, they talked about UFOs pretty much. Um, and two, they talked about reality shifting. And so I put both in this article and it got published. I was like, wow, cool. Because <laughs> they talk about um, a great flood on the planet, just as you hear about when you study Christianity, that there was a great flood. But then they go on and talk about the ant people that came and rescued people. And that's not really covered so much yet in the Bible. Not that I've seen. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <It's good. laughs> yeah, maybe later we'll see it. I don't know. Um, but it's kind of cool because the Hopi have a word for this, that when you hope for something with a pure heart and with a clear crown chakra, that uh, what you believe can come true. And I would agree with that too. I think the purity of heart is really important in keeping that clear crown chakra so that you're open to the divine guidance. It really matters. And again, um, Max Planck, that founder of quantum physics, said when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So he knew, I mean, on a deep level. Niels Bohr, another physicist, said everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. So in other words, things are mostly empty space. They're mostly energy. Now in physics, you'll often see this kind of, I've got a cartoon here that shows on the left side, it's the quantum um, realm, and on the right side is the classical. And that's been a nice way for a physicist to kind of divide it, and so they don't have to deal with the quantum weirdness. Those days are over, thanks to technology and quantum computing. So it was nice while it lasted that people could shut up and calculate, not have to think about what's really going on here. Those days are numbered and I think they're over. So what is happening? I would say quantum phenomena is occurring everywhere and at every scale. And I'm telling you, I've talked to some of the top, the world's top theoretical physicists, they agree. So it's time for us to reconsider our, our assumptions that we've instilled um, in ourselves that um, material realism is, is where things are at. Because you can measure it, then that's all that's real, right? So things like entanglement, superposition of states, conscious observation, tunneling, teleportation, spooky action at a distance. That used to be, you could ignore it, but it's creeping into every single branch of science. We've got the quantum invasion. It's kind of like the Beatles invasion, but now it's quantum invasion hitting every branch of science. And the old guard is a little bit reluctant to deal with it, like, oh gosh, no, we don't want this in biology. But some scientists are thrilled that finally we can understand things. The assumptions that are going out the door have been assumed to be part of science for so long, but they're not really. Assumptions like reality is entirely made out of matter. Holes cannot be reduced to smaller parts. Um, and, um, you know, that's, well, that is what's true. You can't always reduce it. Actions can take effect non-locally, was never allowed for. Um, people used to believe observers could be objective. Now we know that's not true. And uh, probabilities are best we can get when you get into that quantum situation. Causes definitely can precede effects. This is strange territory. So what I'm suggesting that we're going to be seeing a lot more of is quantum logic rules the universe. That's the big set. That's the universal set. Classical deductive Boolean logic of the world of yes, no, true, false. That's a very specialized subset. <clears throat> and certain aspects of physics can never admit a classical understanding. That's how you know this is the case. And the role and domain of classical logic obviously is limited. And subjective perspective 
can therefore uh, literally change the physical world. And this is, these are a couple of physicists that I think uh, are doing some great work. This, when, I, when these pictures were taken, I think they were at the Perimeter Institute and also London. David Jennings on the left saying, nature functions in a quantum manner. And they may not agree with what we're talking about here. Remember, you're not going to get a lot of physicists saying like, oh yeah, this is real. Um, but they are giving us the foundation to understand what is happening. And on, um, on the right is Matthew Leifer, who says, we now have a range of precise statements showing that whatever the ultimate laws of nature are, they cannot be classical. That is true. So um, I've been talking a lot about this, assuming that you might know about things like the double slit experiment. I think a lot of us do know that. But um, just to review, the double slit experiment is so classic because it shows us that the observer makes a difference. So here in this experimental apparatus, you've got a scientist taking a look at, the, um, at these two slits, like two doors, kind of like doorways. And he's in a situation where one photon at a time is being fired through. Um, that's happening because there's um, an obser observational device that knows exactly where that photon is going through. Photons are quantum particles. So the smallest piece of light, the little building block of light, if you will, has the property of either behaving like a particle or like a wave. When it's acting like a wave, then you're getting the kind of diffraction, the, um, the effect of, of uh, either destructive or constructive interference, or, which sets up these kinds of ripples on a pond effect, where you get these lines. And that's what happens when the, the, the wave-like situation is happening. The waves can occur when you're just, when, as long as you're not measuring which slit the, the photons are going through, even if you're just firing one photon at a time. This is very confusing to a lot of physicists. It is, because we, don't, we still don't have one interpretation that everyone agrees with as to what's happening. But what we know for sure is that quantum superposition is real. And the, the Schrodinger's cat experiment is another famous example of bizarre quantum effects. And in this example, if you've got quantum material such as a radioactive, um, uh, it's basically a, a random uh, trigger that can trigger the hammer to break a glass vial containing poison, poisonous gas, which would then kill the cat, meaning that the cat's life is completely being controlled by a very quantum process, and um, which and because the quantum process, it, back in that day when we, could, we they, scientists thought you can have your quantum realm, your classical realm, they were still kind of trying to think that way, um, then the, it was kind of bizarre because now the cat is suddenly, based on the quantum particle being in a superposition of states, because the cat's entangled with that, they're both in a superposition of states. So that means, the, is the cat alive? Is it dead? What is it? What's going on? And we don't, I mean, we know this is happening. We know it's happening at every level of reality. But we don't know exactly why. We don't have an interpretation that says why. This is uh, an illustration from a paper by physicist Yasunori Nomura. And it shows that when we see the outline of something behind an obstruction, like the edge of a chair, we expect that the rest of the chair is behind the obstruction. Because it's entangled. We don't have half the chair is just a blur of, you know, of wave functions blurred out over all probability space. And so Yasunori says we see almost classical physics because we, who are part of the state, are correlated or entangled with the rest of the multiverse. So uh, what happens in the quantum realm, it doesn't really stay in the quantum realm. It's like housekeeping where you try to sweep it under the rug. And that dirt, it just gets bigger and bigger. So you can't hide it. And I think that's what's happening with the Mandela effect. You know, we've hit a, we're hit in that tipping point where people are starting to see that this is happening for sure. We're definitely observing something. And we don't have any such thing as objective reality. And this is something that a lot of physicists would say is definitely true. But again, it's cutting edge and it's in the flies in the face of what we think we know. Um, there's research this year in 2019 experimentally to prove this, that there is no such thing as objective reality, and two simultaneous subjective observers that are both equally trusted at the same time and place will absolutely observe different things. That's amazing. I, I never thought I'd live to see this wonderful development, but it's true. So two observers 
Um, you know, this is for the physicists at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh and the University of Vienna, Austria. The cartoon has two people looking at a figure on the ground. One says six, one says nine. And just because you're right does not mean I am wrong. You just haven't seen life from my side. This is really true for those of us who experience the Mandela effect. And I co-authored a paper with George Weissman, a physicist, and it was about, it's called The Quantum Paradigm and Challenging the Objectivity Assumption. We wrote that two years ago. And we did that because we both shared a fascination for that Tibetan Buddhism I talked about. And because of that, we'd read the same books about time, space, and knowledge, and so forth. And he thought, cool, we've got to write this. So we did and presented it at a conference. Um, basically, the quantum paradigm can be intellectually comprehended as well as embodied. One can live in quantum reality. A good metaphor for this is life as a dream with no real objects as distinguished from experienced objects. And we're going to hear more about that, I think, tonight. Okay, so who are the Mandela Effect affected? Uh, I, I did a study to check and see if there's any s sort of a correlation with the uh, Myers-Briggs interest inventory, because I thought, well, maybe there is something. And what, it was interesting, because if you're familiar with that test, you can take it online in about 15 minutes and find out what you are. Um, and there are different versions of it. Um, what you'll see is there's a huge percentage of people that are intuitive feelers with that NF combination. Either their INFP, I think on the far left is pink, and then at the top right is ENFP, and then INFJ. Uh, what's bizarre is these are not the highest percentages of these people in the general population. These are not. So the people that are experiencing the Mandela effect are actually the rare types, um, yet they're being affected. And here's a chart that shows the personality types key. Um, the intuitive feelers are the N that you see as opposed to sensing, and the feelers over the thinkers. Now that's not to say that you have to be an intuitive feeler to experience the Mandela effect. It just means that that's the majority of the experiencers. So in the shamanic view, the world is as we dream it. Sentient beings dream reality into being. Which raises the question, which I think is the most important unspoken question that most people, including physicists, never look at. Who is the observer? And what is consciousness? Here's a, a cartoon. Can we see that trick again, please? Uh, just showing a bunch of neurons, this neural net map, and then, bing, consciousness. And most of the theories look something like that right now. So, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny <laughs> when you think about it. Like, like, how does that happen? So, I think it's ludicrous. <laughs> I think we have to recognize consciousness must be primary. I have to agree with Max Planck. And so, because we've never yet found consciousness in the neurons, we've never found it with phrenology, that little chart of the bumps on the head, you know, it, it, that's silly, isn't it? But we're still looking at things like MRI scans and we're thinking we can find consciousness. You might find a correlate of consciousness, but I don't think you're gonna find consciousness in any measurable. So I like to go back to Leibniz, who was one of the inventors of calculus, also the founder of science as we know it, uh, just with the idea of elegance as something you look for when you look at a good theory. Leibniz views consciousness as requiring both a first-order perception of something and then a second-order reflective perception. So this is the dude coming up with calculus. If you know calculus, then you're like, oh, that sounds like calculus. If you don't know calculus, don't worry about it. It just means, um, <laughs> don't get scared, don't, don't panic, as they say, Hitchhiker's Guide. So what you want to do is just recognize I'm observing something, but who am I? I'm the observer of the one who's doing the observing. And that is where the sentience comes in. That is the key to it. And then, of course, I've um, talked to people with artificial intelligence, and they're trying to build this sort of thing. And it could be possible. But, you know, what is consciousness really? I think you, need to, you can't look into the machine and find it. You're not going to find it there. So as Leibniz said in Principles of Nature and Grace, it's good to make a distinction between perception, which is the internal state of the monad representing external things, and apperception, which is consciousness, conscience, or the reflective cognition of the internal state. 
And he really believed in the soul, um, really believed in God. Basically, um, consciousness and perception of it arises from unconscious perceptions. And again, we see this with the Mandela effect. We're looking at collective consciousness happening on a global scale. Conscious perception arises gradually by degrees from perceptions that are too minute to be noticed, usually, until they start jumping out at you. <laughs> So who do we mean when we say I? What is that? What is I? Uh, these are pictures of me at different ages. Is that all me? None of us are ever who we were yesterday. Not exactly. We assume we know who we are. And we've got the human infants can pass that self-identity test where you look in the mirror and you know that's you. Uh, there are some animals that can do that too. Um, humans do it by 18 months of age. But who is that? Here's a cartoon showing an old lady in a wheelchair, but she's shadow dancing and remembering an earlier age when she could ballroom dance. So who you know yourself to be is different than who your friends and family see. I think all of us in this room can agree, especially if you're Mandela affected. We have many selves. So a man is as many social selves as there are individuals who recognize him. That's our American psychologist, William James. And self-awareness can reveal that. You can start getting a sense of it. So do you recognize, perhaps, also, you now, that a minute ago you were another? Here's the author, an Italian author of one, no one, and a hundred thousand. And just the idea that you don't even know who you really are. We're choosing that. You know, by choosing who we can be and how good it can be for us, how good we can be, we're making those choices. And you think maybe other people don't notice? Everybody notices. Uh, there are many realities. I think Philip K. Dick tuned into that. He wrote a lot of futuristic science fiction that we've seen in movies like Blade Runner and so forth. And when you look at all these different realities, he took sort of a dark view, actually. Remember that who you can be is who you're allowing yourself to be. Where are you aiming? You know, what are you aiming for? And he did go in some dark places. Um, but he had an idea here that maybe each human being lives in a unique world, a private world, different from those inhabited and experienced by all other humans. If reality differs from person to person, can we speak of reality singular, or shouldn't we really be talking about plural realities? And if there are plural realities, are some more true, more real than others? And we'll definitely be looking at that this weekend. You are not your thoughts. You're not your feelings. Remember why? Because you're the observer of those. You're sentient. So there's nothing more important to true growth than recognizing that you're the one who's hearing that. And here's another great book, Michael Singer, The Untethered Soul. And so if we're looking at levels of self, who are we? So much of what we call self is um, basically operating in that subconscious manner that Leibniz identified and William James was talking about. So it's not a singular operator so much as a multitude of unified subsystems that are working together. And if you don't know what I mean by that, then uh, this is something that I, I was really clear on when I was a young child. I was just looking at people like, why are they just going all these different directions? That They're thinking one thing, feeling another, and forcing themselves to do what they don't even need to do, but something different. It's a mess. So it's a big jumble. And here's an illustration from my book, Aura Advantage, just showing that you can line that up. You can work together with the I am awareness. And what we're noticing with those exceptional human experiences that I'm talking about is you're getting some additional perspective with dimensional depth. This is giving you the ability to start seeing beyond just your two eyes, but to see into what you might think of as other realms, high sense perception. And that was a picture, I didn't explain it. Um, this is an illustration from my book, Reality Shifts, showing flatland, which is uh, just the idea that you can have a world of two dimensions that's very flat. If you push a three-dimensional object through it or move it through it like a rose, the inhabitants of flatland think it's magic, like it's going from a circle to this weird shape that's like a leaf and then it zooms back into a circle, kind of like a UFO or something. And conscious dialogue is really the key to moving forward with the Mandela effect. Biological order comes from information flows. And this, I'm standing next to a researcher. This is Anthony Bell. He was presenting a paper at UC Berkeley about the idea of emergence, submergence, and noise, how brains probably work. 
and I've been working with researchers at Foundations of Mind that are on the same track, that, that there is no such thing as noise. You might think things are random and it's just stupid and a waste of time. We've got a speaker this weekend that will be talking about that. It's not the case, and you'll be seeing it. You might experience it this weekend as well. So basically, we're getting the opportunity to communicate, bubble things up from the subconscious, and bring great wisdom in. And here are two more researchers that I'm standing with, the great Walter Freeman. And he said that consciousness exists as an emergent field in the brain. Uh, and then next to him is um, Giuseppe Vitiello from Italy. Talking, uh, he talks about dissipative quantum models of the brain. So this is that quantum idea again, that we're very much feeling the fields of energy around us. We're connected to ourselves on many levels. We know that. If you've heard about brain waves, then you know that. That your brain, as you're dreaming, it's in a different state. We move through these every day. So we've got the beta wave of excitement, full sensory awareness, the alpha state of passive awareness and deep relaxation, theta drowsiness and unconsciousness, and deep sleep of delta. And here's a cartoon from Futurama. Um, this is a quantum power of observation. It was kind of cool. So on the upper left, it shows this is a race. It's a dead heat. And then the next moment, they're checking the electron microscope. And the winner is number three in a quantum finish. <laughs> and then the guy who's placed his bet says, no fair. You change the outcome by measuring it. <laughs> yeah. So this is like, uh, this is really what we're dealing with. You know, just can you work together with other people? Can you, we build a world together that we all can agree on? Are we able to do that if we're in our ego? Are we going to have to find a better way? So macro scale quantum phenomena occurs everywhere. That was what I've been talking about. It's not just happening at the Planck scale of you know, tiny little quantum particles. Consciousness is the essence of how one identifies as oneself amidst a history of interrelatedness that through observing brings forth a world. And there do exist many possible realities. You identify as a conscious observer. This is the three-part process now of kind of going through this motion of how you select reality. Quantum phenomena such as entanglement, coherence, and superposition and tunneling then can occur. So you're the observer. You're changing things on a global, universal scale. And you're doing it with your compatriots, with other people, with big hearts and big visions and big mind. And that means you can envision a positive past. You might have been given a diagnosis by a doctor. <coughs> they might have told you some bad news. Um, you don't have to believe that. You can look in the rearview mirror and see a rainbow. And you can start with that small little glimmer of hope and build it into something big. And you can do it. I've seen it happen. We'll be hearing about that this weekend. So you can experience no when with visions of positive futures and positive pasts. This is a, that thing that the shamans do all the time. And you can access blissful, beautiful, everyday reality full of exquisite joys, subtleties, and wisdom. And so I'm going to ask you guys now, I'm going to be handing something out. I've got two people helping me. You're going to get an opportunity. If you don't have a pen, don't worry about it. I'm just going to ask that you're going to get something. Don't open it. Don't open it. Just kind of feel a state of love, gratitude, reverence. And um, that's the, the job here is just to feel the sense of quiet mind. Relax your breathing. It's all good. It's just a fun thing. This is absolutely wonderful. And if you want to doodle or write something on it, you can. You don't have to. You just start to think about it. What kind of feelings and images are coming to your mind? Entering into that kind of quantum state here just for a moment, just to have some fun. I'll wait till everybody gets one. I'll just lead a little meditation here. Everybody got one. OK. So now you can just hold it and just kind of, you can hold it in your hands any way you like. You can keep your eyes open or close them if you like. And just feel the presence of this. Kind of feel a sense of what this is. And just feeling love, openness, and joy. And whenever you feel like you might be getting some feelings of something and you want to write it down, go ahead. You can doodle, you can write a word, anything you like. And you can't possibly fail this. This is all good. It's not a test. <laughs> It's just good fun.
and it's private. You don't have to share it. So whenever you want, you can open it and take a look at it. And this will be something um, you can share it or not share it with other people, but it's interesting. It's, it's um, this whole f idea that there is no such thing as noise. I mentioned that earlier, and that's part of this quantum experience. There is no such thing as noise. It's just interesting things. So you'll get something, and you can see what it is. <laughs> and you can have fun with it, and you can share it. <laughs> oh, my dog. Okay. And so why is the Mandela effect happening? I'm just going to be wrapping this up now, and we can move on to questions in a minute. I want you to think about that. And my answer that I mentioned in reality shifts is because. <laughs> it's that thing you never want to hear <laughs> from the adults. Like, why, why, why? Well, what if you take the word because and make it into two words? What if we are the cause? What if we are consciousness? We are the leaders we've been waiting for. Here's a quote by our Nelson Mandela. May your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. And I love to keep everyone thinking, how good can it get? So thank you so much. <laughs>
and maybe being more aware of what's actually happening. Yeah, is that what you think it is? Those I think so. Personality types a little more aware, a little more open. Yeah, there's nothing yeah. wrong with the other types. These are all we need all of them. Right. There's, you know, and they all can be experiencers. So just because it's a tendency doesn't mean it's the only ones. But yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm thinking back to what you just talked about and how when you were a very young girl, you would be able to look at a window and think I'd like the rain to stop, and it would stop. You would think, I would like the rain to start, and it would start. In a way, would that almost be you were causing a Mandela effect of the rain? Yeah, it's, it's like this ancient shamanic practice of working with the weather, absolutely, and recognition of being in a aligned state within oneself and communion with nature. So it's, um, I think it's easier for children, in a way, to access these levels because no one's yet hopefully told them that you can't do that. So again, what you're able to allow yourself to believe could be possible, right. um, can be the guiding force in what is possible. So overall, you would say that uh, you think consciousness is probably the cause of mostly Mandela effects? That's what I'm noticing, it, regardless what theory you might be pursuing, if you go far enough. Because if you stop too soon, then you can say it's a simulation. But a simulation of what? Mm -hmm. What are we simulating? You know, They didn't go far enough. They, they're like, oh, we're done. We got, we got something you know, shiny. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thank you for a great, great talk. Um, a lot of the map changes have just been completely blowing my mind. And we have a map on my daughter's wall that we've both just been looking at, and it's looking completely different from how we remember it. And I'm wondering if you have any theories in terms of like pilots and captains and that sort of thing, and all of the navigation that has to take place, why it's not causing more disruption. Why, um, can you rephrase? What do you mean, why is what not causing more disruption? Well, the changes that we're seeing in the map. Oh, well, in the because map. you're noticing for sure things yeah, are yeah, changing. Yeah, on the, in maps. Okay, and remember so I mentioned the quantum Zeno effect? And that often doctors won't notice, for example, the kidneys have moved yeah. because they've been checking kidneys. They, they won't notice anything changed. They're so entangled with that system state that they move with it. And I think that's definitely true for all the navigators as well. When you're close enough to a subject that you're a subject matter expert, you won't notice that this is happening. And it would be easy for you to say that this is not happening. And the Mandela effect is hooey. Yeah. Because you're only going to notice it in your peripheral vision if, um, if quantum um, physics is having something to do with it. And I believe it is. Therefore, um, anything that you're focused on is to the point that you are that subject matter expert. It's going to be a lot harder for you to witness these Mandela effects. Therefore those pilots, those navigators are going to be just fine. To them, it didn't change. Thank you. Yes. I'll be honest, if anybody I want to use a download, it's my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd like to... Yeah, lift it up. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to understand your perspective on um, uh, when one has um, more of a range of known effects in their life um, coming in as well as interacting with the observer effect and if you see this um, getting much more ramped up in the future as people observe more and know that it exists and um, test the boundaries of what consciousness can do and if there might be uh, future studies into uh, the equation that it requires for someone to understand how this could be used for good. That's like three questions. In Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Very deep. <laughs> okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll tackle the one about um, are things changing? And with all this influx, could someone see as more people come on board? Could we see an expansion? I think yes. I think we are seeing that. I think that is what we're noticing with that graph I showed, that that so-called tipping point happens, and we're getting that effect. So there's a gr grand awakening happening on the planet right now. People are laughing about the Mandela effect. It's a joke, you know, because if you are that subject matter expert, you could pick on that and say, well, this is not happening. I know for sure. 
because to them it's not. But your question then goes, can you rephrase the other, the other part? Because <laughs> um, it went further. Oh yeah, like as more people observe it and uh, want to understand how it works uh, and science uh, takes it to the next level and understands how this whole mechanism works, do uh, you think it can be used with, uh, for good nature? Oh, definitely, yes. Um, this is, I think, the possible solution to most of the in so-called insolvable problems on our planet at this time. So, yeah, I think this has all sorts of range and ability to be extraordinarily useful in, in every possible way. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Cynthia Sue Larson. Thank you. <laughs>